section, I'll preface it with the statement that now is the time to dream because we've been tinkering around the edges of all the, the problems associated with the arm's length approach and what I am going to propose is that we ditch the arm's length approach for multinational financial institutions and actually adopt formulary apportionment for those types of multinationals. So what am I proposing? Well, my propositions are, first of all, that there's one type of multinational entity, the multinational financial institution, which poses particularly significant challenges to the current international tax regime in terms of the profit allocation rules. I want to say the profit allocation rules, I'm actually talking about source and transfer pricing rules. I'm only going to address the transfer pricing rules here today. I'd, I'd like to draw it back to the underlying concepts that we're really looking at here. And effectively, multinational financial institutions are a, a unique subset of multinational entities in the sense that they have developed because of our traditional multinational entities. And our transfer pricing regime of the arms length requirement uh, was written to deal with the traditional multinational entities and, and we've been discussing for two days all of the problems associated with applying it uh, to those multinational entities. So the uh, problems uh, are increased when you're dealing with a specific type of multinational entity which is one removed from your traditional model. So is there really a problem? in relation to the arm's length approach to uh, financial institutions. The OECD has recognised that there's problems. But they first recognised the problem in 1984 in a report called Transfer Pricing and Multinational Entities, Three Taxation Issues. Taxation of Multinational Banks was issue number two. Recognised again in 1998 in the Taxation of Global Trading of Financial Instruments. <coughs> Then it ended up in our uh, current uh, 2010 report on the attribution of profits to permanent establishments. And in that report, we have part one, which deals with uh, what started as what was known as the working hypothesis in relation to applying the arm's length standard to uh, permanent establishments or, or branches. And then this working hypothesis um, changed into what is known as the authorised OECD approach. Now, the reason why uh, banks and global trading, financial institutions, feature so heavily in this document, which deals with permanent establishments, is because uh, that's how these multinational entities operate. They don't tend to structure themselves uh, in the form of subsidiaries, but rather, um, for various reasons, go with a, a, a branch structure. So, in fact, in that document, part two actually attempts to apply what is now known as the authorised OECD approach to banks. And then the uh, third part actually applies it to global trading of financial um, instruments. So the problem has been recognised by the OECD and we've certainly talked about what happens in practice. But the 1984 report uh, talked about complexity. The 1998 report um, recognised that these global financial products uh, operate 24 hours a day. 2010 report, uh, part two, talks about the considerable changes since 1984. Then part three also talks about the 98 document and updating that. The one thing that struck me as I was preparing my slides and going back and, and checking that my quotes were accurate was that we started with this very rudimentary document that was in this horrible typeface that had obviously been scanned and put up on the web. And by the time I downloaded the 2010 document, it popped up on my iPad as an e-book. And the reports had developed in sophistication and length. But in essence, these reports, particularly the 2010 report that I'm talking about, still attempt to apply the arm's length price. 
Now, we know if you look at those documents, de facto formulary apportionment is really what happens. But the OECD um, does maintain that we're using an arm's length standard and then talks about um, profit splitting methods. So, my, my argument is that we should be looking at multinational financial institutions separately and that in fact they are the ideal case study or specific multinational entity to which we could apply formulary apportionment. Now, I'm not talking here about major banks being enablers of transfer pricing, but I'm talking about the banks and the financial institutions participating themselves in transfer mispricing. And I'm talking about the actual financial institutions themselves. And there are a nice neat example of a multinational entity because there's really no question as to which parts of, of the entity fall within uh, the multinational. And there really aren't any or major issues in relation to financial institutions. So, are these a unique subset? Well, I would argue yes, they are, for two reasons. Unique nature of the services and consequent uh, products they supply. Multinational financial institutions undertake an intermediary role in the marketplace. And multinational financial institutions, um, and specifically uh, initially banks, actually arose from the demand produced by the increase in foreign direct investment in manufacturing by you know, high technology mass market oriented firms. So they went for, for what we would call a, a defensive expansion approach, or they were reactive to what their clients wanted. They followed traditional multinational entities. Now, that's one theory as to why these institutions um, became multinational. The other one is obviously internalization, this knowledge advantage that these multinational entities have. And that's born of the client-bank relationship. And that becomes a public good in, in the firm. And they're taking advantage of the information asymmetry, um, which then minimizes their costs. And internalization, which actually explains how the multinational entity achieves this goal of, of cost reduction. Now, a lot of these points also apply to, to other multinational entities, but this potentially is exacerbated because of how uh, financial institutions have developed. Um, there are synergistic gains because this particular type of institution is expanding internationally to meet the needs of existing clients. Traditional multinational entities went out and, and looked for more customers. You know, my iPad that I bought in Australia um, you know, wasn't Apple following me from the US to Australia, completely different markets. Whereas in the case of banks, they're actually following existing clients and they've got all that information and are going out there and meeting the needs of those clients. Now, obviously traditional multinational entities can do both. Um, your financial institutions can also do both but they tells tend to be that, that distinction. Monopolistic advantages and network linkages. Um, the monopolistic advantage of your multinational bank is the personal contact advantage, providing the synthesis of information. So the integrated and exclusive nature um, of the information possessed um, by these banks. And then the network linkages and, and, and that's a two-way flow for these financial uh, institutions. Information isn't just flowing down the chain but of course you've got more than two locations so you end up with a complex set of linkages. Uh, next, non-traditional organisational structure adopted and again the OECD documents actually recognise this. Uh, again, it's explained by the theory of internalisation of the firm. 
different trading models and they're wanting to service time zones. So three trading models that our multinational financial institutions can adopt. Separate enterprise model where potentially your arm's length standard may not be such an issue. Um, Centralised product management uh, model and then your genuine global trading or your integrated trading model where traders in separate international jurisdictions trade off the same portfolio. So what, what is known as the book, and the book gets handed around depending on which market is actually open. And under the integrated trading model, what they're concerned about is the time zone, not the geographical location. Now, even if we put the trading models aside, the operations of these entities fall within four categories. They form as intermediaries for general functions and uh, financial institutions uh, are effectively operating as, as intermediaries. Uh, trading, which is divided into product groups rather than geographical locations, um, and, and traders are rewarded on profitability as a whole. Uh, sales, generally um, responsible for a portfolio of clients, so across jurisdictions as well. Uh, management, um, product clients, economic sectors, particular markets, so they can be cross-jurisdictional. And then your back-end support teams, and they're generally going to be uh, responsible for the integrated entity as a whole. Okay, so that's a very brief overview of why we can argue that multinational financial institutions are different to your traditional multinational entities. So why is formulary apportionment better? Well, for a start, it reflects economic reality. But overall, what unitary taxation does is get away from this separate um, entity approach or separate accounting. We stop pretending that these multinational entities can be divided into separate parts. They are an integrated whole. And uh, Jeremy Halstein wrote in a paper on tax notes in 1993, and it's one of my favourite expressions when it comes to the problem with the current model, is that as in Alice in Wonderland, uh, separate accounting turns reality into fantasy, and then pretends it is in the real world. That reality is the multinational entity as a whole being split out into its uh, separate parts as if they were independent of each other. And that's simply not how it works in reality. So what are these five benefits to adopting formal apportionment here? First of all, it reflects the economic reality of what these financial institutions are doing. It recognises that each part of the multinational entity contributes to the overall profits of the entity. So we're not focusing on individual transactions, but uh, the contribution made by the separate parts of the entity. So. We're not dealing with theoretical prices anymore. We're looking at the economic activity. These institutions are so highly integrated that they can't be divided into their smaller parts, especially when these institutions are undertaking true global trading. But secondly, they reflect integration. It recognises that branches and subsidiaries are integrated and part of the one unitary business. It ignores the legal structure. We suddenly don't care whether this multinational entity has branches around the world, whether it has subsidiaries around the world. Thirdly, it reflects internalization. It reflects what multinational entities are all about. It simply means that we take into account the benefits of the multinational entity internalising the, the knowledge advantage that they have. Consistent 
with the aim of efficient operations. The aim of the multinational is very simple. They want to make money. And in relation to the OECD, a comment was made that um, transit pricing is complex because it takes into account the complexity of business. Well, if, if we take it a step back, business isn't that complex. Business wants to make money. They want to make profits. That's what they're all about. It's the arm's length requirement when we start telling them that you're integrated, but really you've got to separate out and then, and then price your transactions, um, that introduces this complexity. So when we start using formulary apportionment, a tax model that um, allocates income consistently with management policy becomes economically sound. So we're allocating, depending on our formula, uh, out to where the activity is actually taking place, where these multinationals see that they can make money. Finally, a little more theoretical one, distributes rights to an equitable model. Often it is actually argued that um, formulary apportionment operates in a vacuum by considering firm-specific information, and that is the argument for saying it, it's not actually equitable. Um, the economic reality is that multinationals do operate in a vacuum. It's only the income or the loss of the individual multinational that determines the income or the loss to be attributed out to the jurisdictions. Uh, the industry doesn't determine the, profit or determine the profit or loss of specific multinationals. So formulary apportionment accepts that the market doesn't dictate those profits. It doesn't look at how the marketplace would operate. Consequential advantages, arguably, and these, uh, I'm sure we could debate these for days, uh, all of those benefits, but um, it has some practical benefits of providing certainty, um, arguably improves tax compliance, increased simplicity, reduction in avoidance, reduction in double taxation. Now, the one advantage of uh, formulary apportionment, if it was accepted uh, globally, is that you end up with 100% of the taxable profits. So there can't be over taxation and there can't be under taxation. You can only tax 100%. So, my final slide um, is it a big bang approach? Uh, arguably, yes. It, it certainly is. Um, but one of the benefits of, of being an academic is you, is you get to make these claims. Something that TJN wants to do too, to, to um, get out there and, and suggest that there are alternatives when there are methods that are actually broken. So what I wanted to do is demonstrate the theoretical soundness. The biggest problem with formulary apportionment is international acceptance. Huge hurdle and also then the key components of the regime, in particular the formula. This is one type of multinational entity where it may be possible. Thank you.